Thank you for joining us. Today we'll focus on the Jewish community of Latin America with our guest, Dr. Eduardo Cohen, who is the Bnei Brith International Director of Latin American Affairs based in Montevideo, Uruguay. He is a professor of history and the Shoah, and Dr. Cohen has lectured extensively throughout Latin America and will share his views on the challenges facing the Jewish communities of South America following these messages. In 1945, we were at the table in San Francisco when the United Nations was formed. Today, as the only Jewish organization with full-time representation at the UN, B'nai B'rith plays a vital role in the world body, advocating for human rights in all countries and serving as a strong supporter of Israel. The first thing we have to all understand together is the extraordinary importance of the UN as an international institution not only as a political institution for which it's best known, but as probably the most comprehensive and important humanitarian institution, feeding people around the world, educating people around the world, working on health care, and so on. B'nai B'rith has been one of the very important organizations in supporting the overall mission of the UN. Well, we think that B'nai B'rith is an extremely important voice at the UN, uh, most particularly because the U.S.-Israel relationship is so important. In addition to our presence at the U.N., B'nai B'rith also plays an active role as a non-governmental organization in many other international groups, including the Latin American trade consortium Mercosur, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and the Organization of American States. It is this international presence that enables B'nai B'rith to be so effective at helping people around the world. When hard times hit much of Latin America, B'nai B'rith launched its Communities in Crisis program, which has worked with our partner organization, Brothers Brother, to ship and distribute well over $64 million worth of medicine and health supplies directly to clinics, schools, and hospitals in need. After a devastating earthquake hit Haiti, B'nai B'rith once again worked with Brothers Brother and other agencies to deliver critical supplies, and with our partner Israaid, to treat the injured in field hospitals, help to rescue people trapped in debris, and to begin the long process of rebuilding the island nation. When thousands of people fled Darfur to refugee camps in Chad, B'nai B'rith worked with our partner Israaid to provide essential assistance to the most vulnerable people in those camps. Again partnering with Israaid, B'nai B'rith responded to the horrific tsunami that devastated much of Southeast Asia in 2004 and 2005 by helping more than 30,000 people rebuild their houses and regain their lives. B'nai B'rith has been providing this kind of short and long-term assistance in the wake of disasters for longer than any other organization in the United States. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, B'nai B'rith immediately dispatched a team to evaluate just what was needed. They said, what do you need? I'd say, well, I need $10,000 now. And they quickly got, uh, got together and they sent us, the, they sent us a check. We are very grateful with the $150,000 that B'nai B'rith is giving us to fill the void. We were lucky enough, right when we started, to come in contact with B'nai B'rith through mutual networks and friends. And B'nai B'rith, from the very beginning, not only believed in us, but believed in our clients and saw that while things are tough, problems are solvable. And however generous B'nai B'rith has been with us, and B'nai B'rith has been incredibly generous, there is a uniform commitment to repairing the Gulf. It's like tikkun olam, but focused on the Gulf. B'nai B'rith helped churches, synagogues, and other community institutions, including working with Habitat for Humanity, to build a home in Musicians Village in the Lower Ninth Ward. The proud new owners moved in in early 2008. The helping hand of B'nai B'rith is not limited to disasters. Every day, B'nai B'rith volunteers around the world help in ways small and large, whether it's bringing teddy bears to hospitalized children, repairing desecrated cemeteries, delivering holiday foods to elderly shut-ins, or filling in for non-Jewish workers in hospitals on Christmas Day. B'nai B'rith volunteers give back to their communities on a daily basis. Recognizing that senior citizens remain valued members of our community, B'nai B'rith has a leading role in the field of senior services. 
As the largest national sponsor of low-income housing for seniors, the Neighborhood works with the federal government to sponsor an extensive network of affordable, quality housing for seniors of all faiths and races. More than 6,000 men and women throughout the U.S. and many more around the world can thank B'nai B'rith for providing them with safe and affordable housing, plus a wide variety of ancillary services. B'nai B'rith has also become a powerful advocate for universal access to health care. B'nai B'rith plays a key role in advocating for the preservation and protection of Social Security, helping seniors better understand Medicare options, and enabling those who desire to do so to age in place safely and securely. We've started a new initiative I'm calling Age Well, Start Now. Our responsibility as advocates for the aging is not just to be advocates for you, but to be advocates for a continuum. Fighting hatred and prejudice has long been a basic tenet of B'nai B'rith. Today, this commitment is visible in programs such as Enlighten America, Enlighten the World. It can change the way you live. It can take away everything you have. It can destroy your family and make your children's future uncertain. It has hurt more, damaged more, killed more than anything mankind has ever known. What is it? It's hate. And it must end now. The B'nai B'rith, enlightening America and the world, will be here till there's no more hate. With us now is Professor Eduardo Cohen. Professor, it's a real pleasure to have you on the show with us today. Thank you. Well, an obvious first question would be to ask you, how do you see the challenges facing the Jewish communities of South America at this strange time in history? There are many challenges. The main one is anti-Semitism. With different makeups, but at the end of the day is anti-Semitism. We have for the first time in history a sort of anti-Semitism which comes from the state, in this case in Venezuela is coming from the president of the country. We were not used to that. We were used to anti-Semitic incidents, but not such a sort of anti-Semitism. And of course there are another challenges. We have a lot of challenges inside the communities to fight uh, poverty and all the needs and to help not only the needed inside the community, but the needed all over the, the countries where we live. And of course we have the challenges of uh, small communities. We have a lot of countries in Latin America with very, very small communities like in Nicaragua 100 Jews, in uh, Bolivia 200 Jews, or in Paraguay 200 families. And we have to take care of that, we have to help them, we have to, we have to help them to be Jewish and to keep their Jewishness. So we have a lot of work and, and uh, a lot of challenges. And as I said, the main and the first, in, in our opinion, is anti-Semitism and a new sort of anti-Semitism, as I explained before, because 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago, yes, we had the bombing of the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires. Yes, we have the bombing of the, of the AMIA building in Buenos Aires two years after 1984, but this is different. This is the time of the three Ds, delegitimization, uh, first of all, and the question of, of double standard, and it is, uh, it, it, it's uh, delegitimis, uh, delegitimizing <laughs> not only the Jewish uh, people, but the Jewish people to have their own state. This is something we didn't know in, in Latin America. Now we know, and the last thing is two countries that broke ties with Israel, which is unique in the history of the state of Israel in 60 years, which are Venezuela and Bolivia, and uh, they are spreading, especially from Venezuela, a lot of hatred against the Jews and, of course, against the state of Israel all over. Eduardo, thinking of South America, many thoughts come to mind. I worry about the, the terrorist activities you mentioned, the blowing up of, uh, of buildings in, in Argentina and uh, so much anti-Semitism. But anyway, back to the present day, this wonderful time in history, I understand that uh, Brazil has entered into some kind of uh, alliance of some sort, some kind of agreement with Iran. Tell us about it. Yes, uh, Brazil has made several things with Iran. Not only strategic alliance in questions of economy, uh, maybe military, we don't know, but Brazil together with Turkey tried to prove uh, to the Security Council that nuclear uh, Iran is not only not a threat, but including is a good possibility and a good chance for the, for the world to have a new uh, ally in, 
in, in, in this environment. Uh, the Security Council didn't accept that, that's the, the, the fact, and didn't accept for many reasons. The first, they didn't, I mean, the Security Council is not believing that uh, nuclear Iran is going to be a peaceful country. What we think is very dangerous as another, an, another thing that is happening as something very new in the region is that we are not only bringing inside uh, an, a strategic alliance with a country like Iran, but we are bringing inside a country who bombed twice in Argentina two places, causing more than 100 dead people and more than 300 injured, as I tell. But a country which is uh, saying the United Nations that wants to wipe off the state of Israel and a country which is a Holocaust denial. So the question that we make uh, in South America, we as Jewish organizations to the Brazilian government, is what are you bringing? What kind of peace are you bringing to the region? What kind of a strategic alliance are to bring into the region when you're bringing a country which is a sponsor of terrorism, which is a Holocaust denial, and besides wants to wipe uh, off the map one of the member countries of the United Nations. So we think that these kind of uh, alliances are not bringing any good. Well, certainly quite a shocking state of affairs it is. And I have to think about Venezuela. What are your thoughts on that country? The Venezuela, I, I, I wouldn't like to use qualifications to say it's worse, but it is worse. Uh, because from Venezuela, we have a period of time of more or less six, seven years where the president of Venezuela uh, and his different uh, officials, ministers and members of the government started a sponsor campaign against uh, the Jews, I mean an anti-Semitic campaign from the state, which is new, as I said, it's just something new in the region. Because when you have the president on TV and there is an incident in Israel or there was the Gaza war or the Flatija incident, but the president of a country uh, says, uh, terrible insults against Israel, but after the insults against Israel, with a finger is pointing uh, to the audience and saying, no Jew should endorse and support this genocidal government of Israel. Well, the president of this government, in this case, the president of Venezuela, Mr. Chavez, is doing one very dangerous thing. He's inciting the people to harass Jews because they are supporting a genocidal government. Why, if he thinks that Israel mustn't be supported. He doesn't say, we as Venezuelans shouldn't be uh, backing the government. No, only Jews. So he's inciting. And when uh, demonizing Israel and incited hatred is something very dangerous. Uh, there were around 20, more or less 20,000 Jews in Venezuela some time ago, not a long time ago. Today, uh, there is no kind of research to know, but it's no more than eight or 10,000 if the, uh, the people is leaving the country, not only for the problems of insecurity, economic, whatever, because Jews are afraid. This is, this is in one sentence the question. Jews are afraid, and we fear for the Jews living in Venezuela. And you are a brave man for speaking out and doing what you're doing for the Jewish community and for Bnebrith in general. I just wonder what Chavez would do with his country if a neighboring country would bombard his country with 4,000 missiles attacking civilian targets. How would Venezuela respond? Venezuela uh, did uh, in the last uh, year or more when Uribe was president of Colombia and now uh, there is another president, he threatened Colombia many times. But uh, at the end of the day it was very clear that Venezuela is a sponsoring and supporting the FARC, the FARC, the Colombian guerrilla. Uh, Spain has requested people from ETA, which is living in Venezuela, and they are not giving uh, it back to Spain. So we know what Venezuela sponsors, but the behavior of Venezuela, of this government of Venezuela, didn't look very brave when Colombia said, okay, what is the problem? So what I think is that Venezuela is an echo of, uh, of what Iran is saying Venezuela to say, especially about the state of Israel. Because why before 2005, when Chavez was president between 2002 and 2005, there was not one word about Israel, not one word about the Jewish community? Why it started when he started strategic alliances, not only with Iran, but with Iran, with Belarus, with North Korea, 
uh, with uh, Syria. He's very close to Syria and the President Assad. So uh, if 2 plus 2 is 4, uh, we have the answer. So we think that uh, when somebody is too so uh, hard in insulting a country, in breaking ties, in harassing the Jewish community, he should be brave too to recognize why is he saying so. And we realize that he's saying so because of this, I would put like this, strategic alliance. Why is it strategic? Yes, it's strategic for what he thinks is better for uh, the environment of the government of Venezuela because good for the region, good for the rest of the people, we don't see that. It's a country with a lot of insecurity, it's a country which is, uh, if uh, you, I mean, if uh, there is a problem with Colombia or with other countries, he starts insulting the other country. I mean, it has bring unrest to the region. Such a beautiful continent, South America, yet today with so many unfortunate uh, things developing, such as a lot of uh, Islamic terrorists, Muslim terrorists are, I understand, um, integrating into businesses and communities and uh, developing a base in South America in order to attack America and, of course, the Jewish communities there. What are your thoughts with regards to the, uh, the uh, influx of terrorists? In South, in South America in particular, there are 10 countries. We must say that according to UN parameters and UN research, there are countries with high level of democracy, like Chile, like Uruguay, for example. But there are, as you say, especially we have the triple border, the border between Brazil, Argentina and Paraguay there, where not only now we know that Hezbollah people were there or are there, but we know that the AMIA bombing and the Israeli embassy attack in 1992 and the AMIA bombing in 1994 is very likely, I would say 99%, which is very likely, came from there. I mean, so your question is important for today, but it's not new in the region. And it's very sad that it's not new for, for the region because after the second attack, the AMIA bombing, the, re the region should have learned the lesson. We are in clear and present danger not because we live far away, but because borders are too much opened. Eduardo, this is really very interesting. I'd like us to continue, but we must pause for these commercial messages. We'll be right back. Absolutely. We're back with Eduardo Cohen. Eduardo, a question I'd like to ask you is um, the fact that there are more uh, Muslim terrorists infesting South America at this time, do they represent a real threat to the United States of America? I think that uh, United States, I would say many administrations, I don't, we don't know why, which was the, the, the policy, but I think they have forgotten that uh, South America and Latin America in general is much more than a backyard. I mean, we are talking about 500, in this moment maybe more, million people. We are talking about 34 countries. It means that it's not only, as I said, a backyard. It is a world with its problems, but it's the neighbor of the United States. And the United States, uh, the, any administration, should have realized 10 years ago that a president like uh, Chavez making alliances with countries like Syria or Iran uh, should be watched in a different manner. Uh, in this moment, we, your question is very interesting, but we are 10 years late and we know that in this world we shouldn't be one second late because one second is a lot of time if we want to make a, a phone call or whatever. So 10 years late is too much. Now we have the problem inside, we have the situation inside, we have the danger inside, we have bombings that have happened, and we have the threat that they can happen anytime. So I think that is a big threat for all the region, and in this case is for all the Americas. The first threat, of course, if we are living there in South America, is for us because we have the people, as I said, in the same building. But the United States is in the building, in the neighborhood, in the building besides. So I think that the administration, any administration, should listen much more to the governments that are really concerned and worried of this kind of threat. And there are, you have the governments like Panama, like Honduras, like Mexico, like Uruguay, like Chile, like Peru, like Colombia. 
Well, I think that uh, we should work together much more. All we can hope is that there'll be a greater level of rational consideration of the facts in the field and the people will address the challenges and act upon them. I'd like to ask you a little bit about your role with Benebrith International. Tell our audience about your background with Benebrith and what you're doing currently. Well, I'm the director for Benebrith for Latin America. As you know, Benebrith is the oldest and largest Jewish service organization. It was born in 1843 in New York. We are now, we have members now in more than 50 countries around the world. In, South, in Latin America, we have members in 20 countries. What we do in Latin America is the same we do in the rest of the world. We are based on two or three great targets. The first one is political action. We are very concerned of the issues of the Jewish community, but we are, of course, uh, defending the, the rights of the State of Israel. And in the case of Latin America, our place of action in, in a world and in an orga international organization is in the OAS. I am represented by Nebrit in the Organization of American States on all its meetings. And of course, I coordinate the work of the other 20, at the Benebrit in the other 20 countries, not only the political question, but in the community service. We serve not only the Jewish community, but the community in general. Uh, we are citizens of those countries, so we have to help the whole society. My responsibility is to coordinate all these actions, to coordinate the work of all those countries. I am based in Montevideo, Uruguay. I was born in Montevideo, Uruguay. I am based there. Because today to be based somewhere is important, but it's not essential because communications is very easy and you have to travel all the time. But uh, this is, in, in very brief minutes, the idea of the work B'nai B'rit is doing all over the world and particularly in Latin America. And of course, we, uh, when we have the political discussions, we are absolutely concerned on the threats that I have explained to you. And on top of everything else, you're also a professor of history. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it was not my hobby. I used to be when I was uh, much younger, but today uh, uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me to, to teach history when I can. To, uh, I mean, to, um, sometimes I, 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 of course I do it in my, in my country, in, in Uruguay, but I, I like when I can go somewhere else and, and, and to discuss questions of modern history, I, I'm uh, basically, I, I, I try to teach the question of the Shoah and, and not only what happened in the Shoah, but all the consequences of what's happening today. And we have programs. We have very important programs from Shoah through B'nai B'rit in Latin America. And we have exhibits. We have done important exhibits of uh, the Shoah in uh, Chile, Colombia, and Sao Paulo, in Uruguay. And now in Uruguay, it's uh, something exclusive for your program because we are just born, not the idea. We have bought the house and there's the house and we are going to build a very modern and important uh, Shoah Museum. In, Interesting, in like Uruguay. the one in Washington DC, which we Well, visited. we yes. hope that yeah. it's going to be such an important museum. We have another museum in uh, Argentina. It's a little smaller. So we are doing a lot of work in question of education. And we try to do the best. Absolutely. Thank you so very much Thank for being with us, Professor. A real pleasure. That's Thanks great. to you. It was a pleasure. I'll be right back. This concludes our special show for today with Professor Eduardo Cohen. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.